Hi guys, welcome back. Today I want to talk a little bit about the more supernatural cases which I didn't cover in my previous video. I was the object of objective of the last video was really to, to, to look at the, the the reports that suggest the creature is indeed a real flesh and blood corporeal creature. Now I also want to make it clear where I stand as a, as a researcher as well, and that's pretty easy. We don't know what we're dealing with. It's as simple as that. I don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. There are, again, I mean, you'll hear a lot of researchers say, no one's an expert on this. They can only talk from experience. So let's look at a couple of the supernatural cases that support the zoo form uh, theory. So let's look at this. It was about seven feet tall with short, shiny, dark brown hair, large head and had eyes that glowed bright red. There, in that description, we have a supernatural element. It had glowing red eyes. Now, of course, that's, that's, that, we're not familiar with anything that can do that, that has glowing red eyes. So that supports a more supernatural theory. The next one. A gentleman who, on the morning in question while walking his Labrador Retriever around the ancient Iron Age hill fort at Castle Ring, heard the distinct sound of abnormal and unearthly howling coming from a surrounding damp and misty woodland. So loud was the noise that his dog immediately began to draw back and cower in fear. Mr Chapman recalled that upon glancing into the trees, he saw two bright fiendish yellow eyes. You could well put that in the in the supernatural pot, if you liked. The next one, considering she was travelling at high speed, said Jackie, it was a miracle that she didn't hit it. The encounter lasted barely a few seconds, but she caught sight of the animal and, it, and said it was manlike and tall, very hairy, with two self-illuminating glowing red eyes. Again, the red eyes. And these, this is a, a, similar to the accounts we hear over in, in uh, the US and Canada. The next one, as we were driving through the area of fields, I saw something in the road that is really hard to describe. It was on all fours in the middle of the road and looked really odd. About the size of a dog, it had white fur or hair, but it moved in a very strange way and it, and it seemed like you could see through it. It was almost transparent and it just looked at us and moved off into the woods at the side of the road. Now, although this is not, it doesn't sound like a big foot, description to me there are, there are you know there are huge differences there that is a supernatural case and supports uh the zoo form theory or the supernatural theory or the the gin theory uh and there are a few cases like this on the map and it, as i said earlier we we don't know exactly what we're dealing with but it is too early in the day to rule out either of those theories. <clears throat> and we really have to try and learn from, from the guys that have been doing this a long time, the Americans and the Canadians. I don't think there's anything to be gained through ruling out theories without doing some serious research into them. There really isn't. I mean, yes, the supernatural element is, is more difficult to research. Not that the <laughs> corporeal flesh and blood is much easier anyway, but at least we can document that with potential, with prints uh, and the structures. Now, I suppose we can talk a little bit about structures, if you like, and my feelings and thoughts on the structures. I'm not a fan of the structures I've said that from very early on in, in my research. And maybe that's just because it's an area that I haven't really... The bulk of my sort of interest is not in that. I don't think that's where we're going to find the evidence or, or present. I don't think that's where the stronger evidence is going to come from. There's so much wild camping and, and Cub Scouts and... and just camping in general and just kids playing and so much research goes on in these areas that without another maybe 10 years of documenting this stuff like they have done in in, in america 
I don't think we can say one way or another what it is that we're dealing with. I think the glyphs may be a little bit different. I think Deb's more of a, 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 of a, a, a Michael Pelby are more interested in, in the glyphs and in terms of a language. Uh, the stick signs, I think that's that's sort of another matter. I mean, the stick signs and, and the structures are two different things. They're certainly not leaving. They're certainly not using them as shelters, in my opinion. Uh, not the ones that I've seen photographs of, anyway. Uh, are they using them as a uh, as like a notification board? Uh, you know, I, I pass this way, and, and, and the number of sticks means this, and the, the direction it's facing means this. I don't know. There's just not enough research gone into that to make any to to, to make sense of at the minute. And any uh, and I think you're not going to get much argument from anyone. I think the the stick structures are, are are a real difficult one to sort of prove. I think for 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 people in in Britain, and I'm going to use John Chick as an example because John's one of those guys that's been out there a long, long time, and he's up in uh, in Northumberland, Howard Kielder, that area. And John believes that he knows exactly what the stick signs mean. He's he has quite a lot of encounters he knows where they are uh, and I'll be speaking to John and John will be appearing in Elusif I'm going up to uh, to Northumberland to, to, to interview John and to have a uh, a wild camp up there with John in his area I think I think uh, again that the what these particular ground sticks or sticks leaning against trees or snaps tree snaps I can't prove what they mean because you're going to have to be researching in a particular area for for many seasons to get familiar with what what is actually going on and the wildlife in that area, the the species of trees in that area, the, a, a whole host of things, the, the the camping activity in that area, there's a whole, the, the logging activity. There's a lot you, you can't again. This is what I was saying yesterday. You can't just walk in to this subject and expect to solve the mystery in six months, it's, it's just not gonna work that way. You may, depending on the area that you're in in Britain, you may have an experience and sometimes that's all people need. Another thing that I wanted to touch upon that I didn't mention is the, uh, a lot of the time you'll hear debate that there isn't a lot of, or, or any uh, indeed, historical reference to a wild man in Britain, which isn't necessarily true. Again, Deb Hatswell is probably a better person to, to speak to about that. But what you'll never hear mentioned, or rarely hear mentioned, is the fact that a lot of British history, one, British history is not that old at all in the scheme of things. And two, the, a, a massive amount of British history has been written off, forgotten, or lost. Now, am I saying that potentially in that lo lost history, because uh, British history is not very old at all, written British history, the rest of it's archaeological, Am I saying that uh, <laughs> historical reference to a wild man could be in that lost history? It's plausible, is it not? Does it suit Does it suit my way of thinking? Yes, it does. It suits me that potentially that could have been forgotten or lost or deliberately removed. Is it plausible to suggest that? Absolutely, it's plausible to suggest that, given that we were dealing with religious uh, factions and the monarchs that basically directed society at that time and manipulated it to think the way it wanted it to think. So, not too different than today, today really. But, uh, yeah, so there you have it. I just wanted to drop that into the conversation. And I guess stuff like that. I mentioned yesterday, none of us are specifically scientifically trained. I mean, I'm trained in... in I'm a digital compositor, so I know my way around uh, special effects, if you like, and video, that kind of thing. The technical side of that. Uh, I used to be a digital compositor and worked on a, a number of, of productions for BBC, Sky and Living and, and uh, uh, Doctor Who and a couple of more shows like that. It, it aids me in, 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 in filmmaking, I guess, and it aids me in some, I guess, calling out hoaxes should they ever happen because you can look at a hoax generally and if it's a composite, a photograph or a video, and you can 
pretty much rule that out if you can get your hands on the file. Uh, but historically, we could really, this is why we need to sort of spread the word and get historians on board who can help with that. The problem is in these uh, certain study groups is that it's very difficult to get someone to look at something as odd as the British Bigfoot. Because again, we're carrying biases and we've got, you know, certain people have got professional attitudes towards what they do and they don't really want to waste the time. However, if you can find someone more open-minded that can perhaps help out, that would be fantastic. And I think the same goes for the geology as well, which is something I'm particularly interested in. Because if we go down the flesh and blood route, the obvious question is, where are these, where are they hiding? I don't think it's enough to say, well, they're very clever and, 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 and they're brilliant at hiding, you know, the hide and seek champions. <laughs> it, I don't think that, that, that's certainly not a strong enough uh, answer for any, anyone that's, you know, being true to themselves. But, and I think potentially, uh, we, I mentioned, I've mentioned previously uh, mining systems and ancient, ancient mining systems. Uh, but again, I'm not educated enough on the geology of Britain to work out where those areas are uh, the pros and cons of that I mean I, I've been in touch with climbers and cavers that have said that again you, you, you're running into a lot of egos here because well I spoke to one gentleman that said well look there isn't a cave in Britain that, that a, a, a cave hasn't found we've found them all now that's just ego talk and it's nonsense to suggest that you found every cave in Britain. Have you looked all over Britain? No. So you've not found every cave system in Britain. And then I met a really nice guy that said, look, one, one day we were out caving, a friend and I, and at the bottom of this shaft, we found about a dozen carcasses of sheep. Could that be a wild cat? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, potentially. Could it be that the farmer walked out miles to this cave system and, and through, you know, disposed of the dead sheep down, down, down the cave, maybe. Either way, what it tells me is that more research has to be done in, the, in these areas to, to, to rule out these things or to get more information about the possibilities of these things. Because if we're not being realistic when we're presenting a possibility, we're not going to convince ourselves, never mind anybody else. And this is why I'm hoping that word spreads and we can bring bring on board more scientists and more professionals in areas like history geology and, and uh, uh, dendrology tree experts for example uh, wild campers uh, pond guru thank i pond guru uh, richard has, has commented recently in one of my videos and uh, you know he's an experienced wild camper uh fell wanderer fell wanderer if you're listening damien uh, i'm hoping to meet up with damien and and do some while camps of Damien, because these are the people that are more experienced. That's that's the next step. You've, everyone, if you're lucky enough to be, you know, to be a resident in an area with a huge vast amounts of like Northumberland, for example, or in, in places in Scotland, and they've got huge remote areas long, because I still think that that's where the stronger evidence is going to be found. Yes, they are obviously used in rivers and power lines the path of least resistance to traverse the country, just theorising, if they're eating and uh, you know mating and birthing and all that kind of stuff. But I still believe that, I mean, look at, let's look at winter, for example. It seems to me the researchers generally agree, this is just generally from the, obviously I haven't asked them all, but they generally agree that between December and February activity whatever activity they have in their areas, and they know because they're frequenting them, dies down. It seems to die down over that winter period. So, again, this sort of supports a more corporeal, a corporeal animal, doesn't it? Because if it's a supernatural animal, the weather shouldn't bother it. It shouldn't affect activity at all. So we just need really more, more experience in the team. And, uh, you know, and I mentioned that yesterday, people with various interests, various skill sets, because that's, that's really how, how we're going to either rule this out or we're going to prove it one way or another. <laughs> it doesn't look good, does it? You know, the, the, the thousands of guys have been at this 50, 60 years or no nearer. 
Well, I don't know. That really depends how you look at it, doesn't it? Because I think there's a lot to take into account. The American situation is slightly different than ours as uh, politically, uh, religiously. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more going on in, in America than, uh, than there is here uh, in, in regards to stuff in the national parks, for example. Uh, people bring up the missing 401. I do think that's an interesting element. I think it's potentially a reason why more mainstream research hasn't been done. It's a possibility. I'm not saying that's a reason. I'm not saying that those disappearances are anything to do with Sasquatch or, or anything else. I'm just saying that it's a possibility. There is, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, anyway? And if you're not familiar with Missing 401, you should take a look at Missing 401. It's a, it's a really intriguing, one of the most intriguing subjects and topics that I've looked at uh, for a long time. And uh, maybe that's something for Ben Walgate missing uh, missing 401. Ben, you should do that on 401 files. That'll get you. Uh, that'll get you a lot of interest. Anyway, thank you for listening to me waffle again. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be uh, doing the Q and A with with Deborah Hartsworth. So if you've got any questions, visit us on Facebook in the British Bigfoot, and you can post questions there. Or you can message me in the comments below or you can email me at christurnervfx at gmail.com and I'll put some more links in the comments uh, in the description below. So thank you guys. See you soon.